Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 3 with me this morning. We are continuing our study in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. This will be the last study in what might be classified as the pre-ministry period. And last time, two weeks ago, we saw uh, the reaction of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the common people, the publicans, and the soldiers to the to the uh, message of John the Baptist. We heard him respond to them. And now this time we're going to hear him announce the Messiah. So in Luke chapter 3, we left off with verse 14. We pick it up in verse 15. And the the parallel passages in Matthew and Mark are only a couple verses. Uh, Matthew 3, 11 and 12 uh, Mark 1, 7, and 8, they say a little bit differently, but essentially the same thing as in Luke. Uh, Luke is a little bit more expansive, and so we're going to look at Luke starting in verse 15. That says, As the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. So circling back to verse 15, we see that the people are in expectation. Just like the entire nation, those who are down at the River Jordan with John, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the common folks who were there, the publicans, the, uh, the soldiers, they're just like the entire nation. They have a great anticipation that the Messiah is coming. And, there's, and that's because there's a lot going on. Uh, There is a cultural war being raged in their land. Uh, The cultural war waged by first Greece, adopted by Rome, still being waged by Rome. And it's the thing scholars call Hellenization. Uh, Helen, uh, Greece, the, the Greek culture being imposed on the entire world. And it involved a language. From the Jewish perspective, it was a language of strangers, although they did acknowledge that that language was as precise as their own, and so they did translate the scriptures from Hebrew into Greek so that people could read it. Uh, Part of the Greek culture was also the celebration of the human body, the beauty of the human body. Now, I was telling uh, Chuck and Mary, they made some comment, and, and so did Gabe, about my shirt, and... You know, uh, I like loose shirts. When I was in my 20s, I wore fitted shirts. I could wear fitted shirts now, but it wouldn't be pretty. (laughs) They celebrated the beauty of the human body with sculptures of nudes and paintings of nudes and things like that. The Jews, on the other hand, celebrated the beauty of God. And they were very, very modest in terms of presenting the human body. Uh, The Greeks were all about all things beauty and all things power, their structures and everything else, but the Jews believed in a very simple, humble lifestyle. And finally, the Greeks were all about the philosophy of men, but the Jews were about the word of God. So there was a cultural war going head to head all the time at this point, and that was one of the things that they were burdened by. Uh, They were also, of course, burdened by the political system of the most cruel of the Gentile empires that were to lord over them, the Roman Empire. Uh, And in the midst of all that, God had been kind of silent for 400 years, and so they were expecting the Messiah to come. And all of a sudden comes this man named John down to the River Jordan, and he's doing something that's never been done before, baptizing Jews with water, and he's preaching a message that's pretty strong, and they're thinking to themselves. They're not having a public debate about this. They're just thinking to themselves about John. Is he the Christ, the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah? Is he the Savior? Verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, 
I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, they're thinking, is this guy the Messiah? Who hears their thoughts? Who knows their thoughts, their motives? Only God does. But the Holy Spirit tells John what they're thinking, and he prompts them to answer the question they have not asked him. It has not been verbalized, but the answer is. And he says, I baptize you with water. In Matthew's account, it says, I, I baptize you with water unto repentance. And that's a key, th key phrase because there, our greatest need is the forgiveness of God, but there is no forgiveness of God without repentance. Our agreeing with God, our turning from our way and following him. No repentance, no forgiveness. I baptize you with water unto repentance. And then he goes on to say, but there's one mightier than I that is coming. In verse 4 of Luke chapter 3, it says, as it is written, in, because I wonder who he is, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. In the Greek, it's capital L-O-R-D. That's quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. John is the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way for God himself, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he goes on to say, I am not worthy, back in verse 16, I am not worthy, I am unfit to even so much as untie the straps of the sandals of the Lord. In Mark chapter 1, he, it, it says, I'm not fit to stoop down and loosen the straps. In Matthew, it says, I'm not worthy, I am unfit to carry the sandals of the Messiah. All those together are true because all those things is what the lowest servant in the house would do. That was the... the lowest job on the totem pole was to care for the feet and for the sandals of the master and his family, which is precisely the point Jesus will make later in John chapter 13 when he washes the feet of his disciples as an example to them. So what John is saying here, he's expressing his humility. He's saying, I am... I'm unfit to even be the lowest servant in attendance to the Messiah. And he goes on to say that the Messiah is going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. First, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. This is not New Testament teaching. This is not new about being the Spirit of God being poured out. In Proverbs chapter 1, starting verse 22, we read, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you, and will make known my words unto you. Recorded, inspired by the Holy Spirit, recorded by King Solomon. In Isaiah, chapter four, we, we read chapter 43, right? At least the first 15 verses of chapter 43. Uh, the first three verses of Isaiah, chapter 44, read, And now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou just your run, a reference to Jerusalem, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offering. Who is pouring out his spirit? The Lord is. In Joel chapter 2, uh, we read starting verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon thy handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in heavens and on the earth. And he's talking about the great 
glorious day of the Lord. Who but God can baptize a person with God? All men, Psalm 14 and others, quoted by the Apostle Paul as he recorded what the Holy Spirit inspired to write him in Romans chapter 3, there is none that are righteous, no, not one. All are sinners, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Only God himself can baptize a person with himself. Does that make sense? All right, so there's a baptism of the Holy Ghost, and then it says, and with fire. About 400 years prior to John speaking these words, uh, Malachi was inspired to write, but who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. Fire in the scripture is a picture of judgment and vengeance. It's a cleansing thing of that which is, should be burned up. Uh, judgment belongs to whom? The Lord. Psalm 8, excuse me, Psalm 7, verse 8. The Lord shall judge his people. Psalm 50, verse 6. The, the, God is judge himself. Psalm 75, verse 7. God is the judge. He puts down one and sets up another. And Psalm 96, verse 13, regarding the Lord, he comes to judge the earth with righteousness and the people with his truth. Judgment belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to whom? In Deuteronomy chapter 32, we read, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. In Psalm 94, the Lord God to whom vengeance belongs. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so the one for whom John is preparing the way is going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The coming Messiah is God. Right? So, as we look at that, baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire, uh, is that one baptisms? Or is that two? Is the baptism of the Holy Ghost the same as or different from the baptism of fire? Well, we need to ask ourselves some questions. When did Jesus baptize with the Holy Ghost? After his first coming. When he came to do what the Father sent him to do, when he came to say the words the Father sent him to do, and after having done so, he dwelt amongst us for 40 days, giving us many infallible proofs that he was risen, and then he went to the right hand of the Father, and he goes, now go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 disciples in the upper room, and out they went by the power of God to preach Jesus Christ and him risen, be witnesses to him. That's when Jesus baptized with the Holy Ghost. When is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost? Uh, to this very day. To this very day. It has not stopped. When will, past, present, future, when will Jesus baptize with the Holy Ghost? In Joel chapter 2, after he takes his bride off the earth, he's going to pour out his spirit upon Israel, and they will be his witnesses on earth. Now, past, present, future is a baptism of the Holy Ghost. When will Jesus baptize with fire? Has he baptized with fire? He has not. He will. He will in one of two times. He will at the, at the end of an unbeliever's life, after they've taken their last breath, there's a baptism of fire. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, to reject his love and his grace and his mercy and insist that he, he either doesn't exist or you're good enough to stand in his presence. It's a fearful thing. And that's a baptism of fire. He will also baptize 
with fire in the day of the Lord when he comes again, his second coming, as the king and the judge. So as I read it, the entirety of Scripture, the baptisms of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire are two separate baptisms. Uh, one the baptism of the Holy Ghost, is unto eternal life. The other, the baptism of fire, is unto eternal death. And it's our choice. Which baptism do I want? Which baptism do you want? Verse 17. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. With those two different baptisms, one unto eternal life and the other unto eternal death, we see in view here the one primarily the one unto eternal death, the baptism of fire, because he has, the one who is mightier than John, the one who's coming after John, has in his hand, it says fan, but the, the Greek underneath that means a winnowing fork or maybe a shovel. It's what was used to toss grain into the air. He has his winnowing fork, his winnowing hand in his hand, and he is at his floor. The floor is a threshing floor. And that was a place that was elevated. It was an open space. It didn't have a covering. It didn't have walls. It was a place where the wind could blow unimpeded. And the ox-trodden grain used, the ox would be the ones <coughs> to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the harvester would take this, this fork or this shovel and throw it in the air. And the heavier grain would fall at his feet. The chaff would blow down wind. Harvest time. It's his harvest. And he's going to gather up the wheat that is at his feet. And he's going to put it in his barn. Then he's going to take the chaff and gather all that up and do what? Unquenchable fire. Eternal punishment. Hell. Subsequently, the lake of fire. You see, the harvest is his Separation. Uh, he separates the righteous from the wicked. And the difference between the righteous and the wicked is the righteous believe him, believe the word of God, submit to the authority of the word of God. The wicked don't. He separates. Uh, in this separation, he separates, therefore, the living from the dead. And that has nothing to do with physical life. That has everything to do with spiritual life. He's going to separate, in, in the metaphors, the wheat from the tares. The tares look just like the wheat, except at harvest time, the wheat, and it's, you know, it's top-heavy, it bows down. The tares stand up straight and proud, easily distinguish between the wheat and the tares. He will separate. And, of course, with the process, he will separate the wheat from the chaff. John the Baptist's announcement here of the Messiah uh, is recorded here in Luke, which is written to the Gentiles. It's recorded in Mark, which is written to the Gentiles. It's recorded in Matthew, which is written to the Jews. Uh, it's given to all of Adam's race. All of Adam's race is given the invitation to accept the eternal life being offered by the Messiah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or if they so choose to reject it, uh, then they're warned, being warned of eternal judgment and death. Uh, all fall short of the glory of God. All are sinners. None have an excuse. No one will be able to stand before God with an excuse. We're all accountable for the revelation of God we've been given. Verse 18 and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. You see, he's preparing the way for the Messiah. He's encouraging them to receive the invitation they're about to hear. And he's warning them of the consequences if they don't. 
So who is this mightier than I who is coming? Who is this Messiah? Who is this Savior of the world? Go with me now to John chapter 1. And while you're turning there, the Gospel of John is written about 30 years after the other three Gospels. It is radically different than the other three. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's recorded by the Apostle John. It's written to the church. And the purpose for this gospel is to reprove correct Gnosticism. Gnosticism, even then, had infected the church. Gnosticism is the exaltation of the knowledge of man. It resulted in a intellectual elite that lorded over the uneducated common man. And Gnosticism is the root of both the Roman Catholic Church and Calvinism. And this gospel is God's antibiotic to the body of Christ for this infection. Starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, we could go on for weeks in the, the passage we're going to cover today. Understand that. But we, there's a message here, and we're going we're to make our way through it here. Uh, in the beginning. Have you read that before? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, in the beginning, the Word. Uh, in the, the Hebrew commentary called the Targum, the Hebrew word they used was memra, M-E-M-R-A, to refer to the word of God. When they translated the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek, called the Septuagint, they used the Greek word logos. Both of them, in the Jewish mind, spoke to an instrument, the instrument of God's creative work. Spoke to the wisdom of God and that which announces and interprets the will of God to man and that which mediates between God and man. And now, maybe 100, 150 years after the Septuagint, we have the Gospel of John, we have his three letters, and we have the, the book of Revelation, all inspired by the Holy Spirit, recorded by the Apostle John about the same time. We have the Word that is the second person of the Godhead. He is the image of God, full of grace and truth. He is Jesus Christ. So, the Word existed. The Word was, in the beginning, was the Word. Meaning, before creation, and time is just a dimension of creation. Before creation, the Word was. The Word is self-existing. And the Word was with God, coexisted with, linked to, separate and distinct from, yet intimately related with, part of God. And the Word was God. The Word was God. The same nature, attributes, characters of God, the Word was 100% God. The Word was not a created being. The Word was not an inanimate object. And we read in verse 3, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word that was before creation, the word that was with God, the word that was God, is a person. And we also notice that this person, the word, is a creator. Of what things? All things. The word was involved with every step of the creation account. Day one through seven, and the sustainability of that creation ever since. So, who's the creator? God. Well, what is the word? God. Uh, verse 4. 
In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, again, as I said, written about this same time are the three letters uh, recorded by the Apostle John in the first one. And, and the purpose of the first letter is the same as the gospel, an antidote, a, an antibody for the Gnosticism infection that the, the body of Christ was suffering. Uh, the first verse in the first letter is that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, the word of life. We know the word is the second person of the Godhead. We know the word is Jesus Christ. He is life. In the fifth verse of chapter 1, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is life. God is light. And in chapter 4, we read that God is love. Uh, In chapter 5, we read, and, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son, He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. So if you're here, as as I was in church for a while, after I decided, after we were married and my wife was unequally yoked and I was going to church with her and I was sitting there in my mind challenging everything I was hearing, I was sitting there in church breathing. I was alive. According to the Word of God, I was dead. That was a hard one to swallow. But the word is what the word is. You see, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were clothed in light. They had his life. They were in relationship with him. His love indwelled them. But what what did they do? They sinned against him. And what entered into the creation? Death, and when death entered the creation, the light with which they were clothed went out. And then they realized, oh my goodness, we're naked. They didn't know that before. So, as we consider the Gospel of John, 1 John, and all of Scripture, the Word is life, the Word is light. The Word is God, and God is Spirit. So, therefore, life is spiritual. It's not physical. It's spiritual. Therefore, death is spiritual. And light is spiritual, and darkness is spiritual. Are you with me? That makes sense? It's, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C on a, a number of different characteristics. Uh, verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This life, light, word, person, God, appeared to those who were dimmed or obscured by death due to sin, but they did not receive him. They rejected him. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So is this John the Baptist or the Apostle John? This is John the Baptist. God sent a man to be his witness of the light, of the life, of the word, of this person, of God. And that person, of course, is John the Baptist. And he bore witness of the light so that whosoever would believe, whosoever would trust in the light could come out of the the darkness. Whosoever would come to spiritual life will be delivered from spiritual death. Oh, and spiritual life is eternal life, and spiritual death is eternal death, and we're born into eternal death. And we bear, we hear a witness of the life, 
and the light. And when we believe, we are rescued out of darkness and put into light. Uh, now, the thing is, we're going to learn is that light's going to do all the work, right? The light is going to do all the work necessary to deliver the prisoners in darkness to make them citizens of his kingdom of light. All those who are in darkness have to do is to choose to believe the light or not. And it's an invitation from God. It's not the imposition of God's will. It is a choice of man. It's not a forced march by God. And so we read also that he, verse 8, he was not that light. In John 13, 15, when we started, the people who were down there at the River Jordan thinking amongst themselves uh, or to themselves, who is, is this the Messiah? The answer is no. No. God is the light. Verse 9 little qualification here that's important. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John the Baptist bore witness of the true light, which means what? There's a false light. If there's a true light, there's a false light, a deceiver with a false message. If you turn to the right with me, we're going to come back, of course, to John 1. But if you turn to the right to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. To a confused, disorderly church in Corinth. Worldly. The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to record two letters. We're in the second letter, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Would to God... You could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if, we, if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might bear well with him. The Holy Spirit is gathering a bride for the Son. And he's a jealous God. And the serpent is deceitful, very, very subtle. And the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is very concerned that those who are calling on the name of Jesus would accept another Jesus. They would accept another spirit, that they would accept another gospel. Going down to verse 12, relative to those who carry that false message and that false gospel, but what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. And if you go to chapter 4 in the same book, a false light with a false message is even in the church in the 50s and the 60s when the Apostle Paul's ministry is going on. Chapter 4, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But... If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, 
in whom the God, small g, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. Spiritual warfare, raging, light versus darkness, life versus death, love versus hate, going on to this day. So those who are going back to John chapter 1 and verse 9, a true light and therefore a false light. Those who are in darkness must choose to believe a light. Maybe it's the true light which comes with a gospel calling men to repentance, convicting them of sin and leading them to repent of their sin and leading them to humble themselves before a holy God and by grace through faith being delivered out of darkness into life and in the process being given a new soft heart and the eternal life of Jesus Christ. That's one choice. The other choice is a false light which comes with another gospel, a message that says, you're a good person. You don't need to convict of, you, you don't need to repent of sin. There's no judgment. There's no hell. You don't need to change. God loves you just the way you are. You just need to be enlightened, which is a subtle way of saying, I want you to remain blinded in darkness because I'm going to march you right into eternal death. And false gospels, like all people go to heaven, will lead in darkness. Uh, the false gospel that God is in everything and everything is in God will lead to darkness because God transcends his creation. And the false gospel that the God of the Muslims is the God of the Christians and the Jews will lead you to darkness because it's false. It's a false light. Verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. The word... The word that created the world came into the world and the world rejected him. Didn't want anything to do with him. They were blinded by the darkness and they liked it that way. Verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. His own, who's that? Israel. Isaiah chapter 43, verse one, I created Israel. He created them, a people unto himself. And he who created this special people came to them and they rejected him. They did not trust him. They did not believe him. They did not receive the invitation that he came with. Verse 12. Next word. But. Oh, a contrast to the wickedness of verses 10 and 11 is verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Whosoever in the darkness leans on, trusts, the light, Jesus, is given by him, Jesus, given the power of God to be raised into eternal life and to become the children of God, to become the children of God because in darkness, they're not the children of God. There's another one for you. All people are God's children, not according to the Bible. Read Ephesians 2. But you have, uh, we have an opportunity by so choosing, by so believing, to not be the children of the God of this world, be, to be given the power of God to become the children of God. Uh, it's, a, it's a resurrection. That which was dead is now alive. Jesus would call that born again. A spiritual birth to someone who's obviously been physically born. 
Uh, this new birth is from death to life. Therefore, it's not natural, is it? What's the natural progression from life to death? This one is from death to life. It's supernatural. It's not by, it's not a work of the flesh because the flesh is powerless and the flesh is anti-Christ. The flesh does not trust Jesus. The flesh does not want anything to do with the word of God. The flesh refuses to be governed by God and to accept God's order and it's anti-Christ. Now, if it's not by man, it's by, by God. It's the power of the Spirit. It, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual birth of him who is spirit. Verse 14, really important verse. And before I start, please don't leave this morning without understanding this. If you don't understand, please come see me. Or if you just need to chew on it, go home. It'll be uploaded. Listen to it. There's a pause button. Think about it. My notes will be uploaded. Look at them. This is really important. Verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, life, light, God, became a man. He was not a man. He became a man, which fries people's brains. It shouldn't. If you believe in the beginning God, what could you not believe? See, it is most certainly impossible for man to become a God, as the Mormons will teach you. It is not impossible for God to become a man. If, he can, if the almighty God cannot become a man, then he's not almighty. Uh, but the key phrase here, the only begotten of the Father. John the Baptist bore witness of the only begotten of the Father. Okay. Why is that so important? Begotten. Well, when... What's, what's the verb used for the mother? What does she do to a child? She bears, in past tense, bore. Of the father, it's begotten. The mother does not beget. The father begets. The mother bears. And so the only begotten of the father is saying that the son of, which the Greek word means para, which also means from, the son from the father became the son of the mother. Right? That's what happened at the incarnation. Uh, The son, the mother, the seed of the woman. Not the seed of Joseph, the seed of the father, begotten of the father. This is really really important. On the the bulletin message, I introduced the topic. The only begotten of the Father is a phrase used only five times in Scripture. It's those verses listed in that little brief announcement. They're all given by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle John and about the time this infection called Gnosticism had infected the church. This only begotten Son This phrase is a foundational truth to our faith. Now, the Greek word is monogenes, M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S, monogenes. And I don't want to get too technical, but some of the stuff is is, is so important to understand. Uh, Mono means what? Well, monotheism means there is one unique God. Monosyllable means there's words with one syllable. Monogenes means one unique genesis. Unique. Translated by 
the King James translators into the English as only begotten, monogenes. It does, monogenes does not mean one. That's monos. It does not mean one and only. That Greek word is also monos. Monogenes means, and it's only spoken of Jesus. It means a unique relationship with the Father. A unique relationship. It means he is the sole representative of the character and the being who sent him. It means he also possesses all the attributes and all the characters of the being who sent him. And a unique Genesis. Where do you and I come from? Man and woman. Trace it all the way back to Adam and Eve. Jesus has a different Genesis. He is, he has an unoriginated relationship, an eternal union. Eternal meaning before the first day and beyond the last day. He has an eternal union with the Father in an unoriginated relationship. And so he is the only begotten rather than becoming the only begotten. At the incarnation, when Jesus was born, he did not become the Son of God. He has always been the Son of God. What he became was the Son of Man. And what was his favorite term for himself when he was talking to people? The Son of Man. Because to him, that's the mind-blowing thing. The Son of God, he's always been. He's always been. Now, in Scripture, we do read uh, that Jesus is called the Son. We read that he's called the Son of God. But never, 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 never in the original Greek language is he called the monos only of God. He's called the monogenes of God. And so if we call him the only if we call him the one and only, then we're standing contrary to Scripture because God has sons. We read in Isaiah 43, Israel's called the sons of God. Angels are called the sons of God in Job and Ezekiel and in Isaiah. Even the fallen angels are called sons of God. Adam in Luke chapter 3 when we get there, Adam's called a son of God. For those of us who are regenerate in the spirit, born of the spirit of God, we become sons of God. What all those categories have in common is they're created beings. Jesus is not a created being. He's not monos. He's not one. He's not the one and only. He is the only begotten. He is monogenes. So what does your Bible say? If you're reading the NIV, the English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New Living Translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, God forbid the message. God forbid the New World Translation, which belongs to the Jehovah's Witnesses. In this verse, in chapter 18, in all those listed in your bulletin, you will read either one or one and only. Did the Greek scholars responsible for those English translations, did they fumble? Did they translate monogenies as they would monos? Well, you have to consider the source. And the source is the Greek manuscript that they used. There are two Greek manuscripts. 
There's the, re, the, the received text. In Latin, the Textus Receptus. It's called the majority text. 95% of the original language manuscripts we have are of this category. They were used by the early church fathers. They were used by the Protestant Reformation. They were used by the King James translators. These were manuscripts that were located in Antioch, Syria. Does the name Antioch mean anything to you? Acts chapter 11. It was in Antioch that the followers of Jesus Christ were first called Christians. It's where the apostle Paul spent so much time. He was sent from there. That was his home base. That's the received text. The other group is called the critical texts. And they've been touched by two Cambridge professors named Westcott and Hort. And in, 19, excuse me, in 1881, they found, if you will, Alexandrian manuscripts. It's called the minority text. Only 5% or less of the original language manuscripts we have are of this kind. They were used by Origen, way, 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 way back, who is an apostate unbeliever and who is the source of much of the heretical dogma that the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Uh, the critical texts by Westcott and Hort were used by the, well, no, they, they, what Origen wrote was, was what the Roman Catholic Church would later use to translate an anti-Protestant Reformation Bible. And it's called the text of the higher critics. Of course, it comes from Alexandria. Alexandria is in Egypt. Alexandria was at the very center of Greek culture and thought and philosophy. And there in Alexandria, scholars improved the received text by making corrections to it. So we have man interpreting scripture, not the spirit interpreting scripture, not scripture interpreting scripture, but man interpreting scripture, and so what's the result? A corrupted text. All the, the many, 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 many pieces of Texas Receptus, the received text that we have, they agree with each other. God preserved his word all these Alexandrian texts that we have, they contradict each other. There's many, many contradictions in the Alexandrian text. And so these two manuscripts from which English translations have come, the received text by the Reformers, which was, uh, the Reformation was in response to the apostasy of the church in Rome, and the critical text, text which were fostered by the higher critics, the humanists, the Gnostics, Westcott and Hort, they use different manuscripts and they use different techniques to translate from the Greek into the English. The King James translators use what's called formal equivalence. The primary objective was to be true to the original language and to translate it word for word. Westcott and Hort used what's called dynamic equivalence. Their objective was to make it more readable and they translated thought for thought. And so they have produced, obviously, very different results. And perhaps the most radically different result is the translation of the Greek word monogenes in John 1, 14, 1, 18, 3, 16, and the other two listed there. Uh, the received text says only begotten. The critical text translated into English, which is all the modern translations, uh, says one or one and only, as if they were translating monos. So either it's poor scholarship or it's deceptive scholarship, but the result is one or one and only dilutes the nature and the deity of Jesus Christ. And it is an attack, as subtle as it is, it's an attack on the foundation of our faith. Westcott and Hort, 130, 140 years ago were motivated by a disdain they had for the King James. 
And at that time, it was probably the impact of the King James on English-speaking people. They had a disdain for King James. They wanted a better translation (laughs) using better manuscripts, which they found in a trash can at a seminary in the Egyptian Sinai, and they found in the Vatican Library. Uh, Westcott and Hort, both of them denied the infallibility of the Word of God. Both of them denied that salvation is by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Instead, they believed that we're saved by works, including baptism and church membership. Westcott and Hort both agreed that the Church of England should return to Rome. And both Westcott and Hort praised Charles Darwin for his theory of evolution, which undermines Genesis chapter 1, which destroys the entire Bible. Uh, Westcott, in fact, Westcott and Hort are two English translations what Charles Darwin is to the creation account. And it comes with the word monogenes found in the Gospel of John given by the Holy Spirit as an antibody to combat the Gnostic infection. So where are the Gnostics going to attack the Word of God? Right there. And so they have. And you will hear pastors say, you will hear Calvary Chapel pastors say, it does not matter what Bible you read. Oh, M-G. It very much matters what Bible you read, what Bible you study. Consider the source, either the received text that was preserved or a corrupted text by Gnostics. I read, I study the English translation of the received text. It's called the King James Bible. I do not read and I do not study from the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, the NLT, the RSV, the HCSB, or the New King James either. Because where they, whereas the New King James does translate Monogenes as the only begotten of the Father, all these other areas where the Alexandrian texts disagree, they generally agree with those guys. And the foundation for the Alexandrian text is Westcott and Hort. And that's trouble. You've got to understand that. It's really important. As you can see, people are flocking here to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. So going back to verse 14, and we're going to try to wrap it up here quickly. Uh, the only begotten of the Father is full of grace and truth. He is the true light. Therefore, the false light is full of condemnation and rules. Verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John the Baptist is bearing witness of the word, the light, the life, this person, God, who is from everlasting, who is eternal, who came before him. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus was born six months after John. The light of the world came into the world six months after John did. But John existed from the moment of his conception, Jesus has always existed. He's been self-existing. He's not created in time, as was John. Verse 16. And of this fullness we have, excuse me, of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, All of us who trust the light, who lean on the life, who've received by faith the love of God and Jesus Christ, the Word, is our Lord and Savior, we've received how much of God's grace and truth? The fullness. Nothing has been withheld from us. 
Verse 18, no man has seen God any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. No man has seen God at any time. What about Adam? He walked in the garden with God. Who was he walking with? The Word. He was walking with Jesus. Jesus is going to tell us in John chapter 4 that God is a spirit, must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And it is God the Son, the only begotten Son of the Father, who will reveal to us the Father. And that's why, uh, just before he goes to the cross, and he tells his disciples, you know, it's, it's good that I leave, that you may know the way. And Philip pipes up, well, show us the way. Show us the Father. Philip, you've been with me all these years now, and you say you haven't seen the Father? That's why I came. If you see the Father, excuse me, if you see me, you see the Father. So, who is this? Going back to Luke chapter 3 then. The one that John the Baptist said is mightier than I. It's going to come after him. Who is that? That is the word of God. That is the true light. That is life. That is God. That is the only begotten of the Father. That is the Savior of Israel and the Savior of the whole world. That is Jesus Christ. The question is, do you know him? Or do you even want to know him? If you want to know him but you haven't met him, perfect time right now is to meet him. Uh, And yes, it's true. Just like it was true for me, it's true for you. You're not worthy to even touch his sandal. But the fact is, he came to rescue you out of the darkness and to put him into the kingdom of his light. And he's done all the work. All you got to do is agree to confess him as Lord and Savior to, as Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And later, when everyone's leaving him because he's teaching some really hard things for them to get their heads around, and he asks his disciples, are you guys going to leave too? And again, Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. The word is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Above all things, apart from loving his father and serving his father, he wants a relationship with you. So if you would just close your eyes again. Don't don't look around. If you have never met Jesus, but you want to, and you want to know him, and you want to follow him, then just look him in the eye and say so. It's as simple as that. Jesus, I I want to know you. And if, if that's you this morning... Look at me, that you would make a statement to man. You're not saying, I'm just a man, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But if you don't mean it, don't look at me, don't look at God and say you want to know him, but in your heart you really have no intention to follow him. But if you, on the other hand, know him, and you want the power of God to be a witness of him in this dark world, just like John the Baptist was, then you need his baptism. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of God from on high. And if that's something that you want today, just look at me. You you look at the Lord. Don't see me. I, I, I don't matter. But look at the Lord, look him in the eye and say, yes, Lord, I want that. You are God, baptize me with God. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is Jesus. (laughs) This whole book is about you. Lord, may your word not be snatched away by the fowls of the air. 
May your word not find shallow soil in our heart. May your word not find thorny soil in our heart. May your word find good soil that bears fruit. Fruit pleasing to the Father for the glory of the Son, in whose name we pray, amen.